Welcome to this session of organizational behavior. In this session, we will be talking about different uh, concepts of uh, motivation. Uh, it's covered in uh, chapter 7. When we talk about motivation, uh, it's very crucial for organizational behavior because we are talking about the, motiva the motivation of the workforce uh, at the same time the motivational factors that work with the leadership the managers in um, different years of the organization so in this chapter primarily we will be looking into the three key elements of motivation um, and then we'll be looking into a lot of theories um, that's the first uh, uh, warning I have for this session uh, we'll be looking into the earlier theories of motivation and then uh, walk, uh, work our uh, way around uh, uh, to the newer theories which are more ac applicable nowadays uh, in the industry. Um, eventually, then we'll be looking into uh, the issues of equity, uh, justice, and then uh, we'll be looking into the applications of key tenets of expectancy theory and other related theories uh, to motivate the employees and then we will be summing up this conversation uh, to know why and how the managers should uh, motivate uh, the workforce. Now according to the book uh, motivation is the process that account for an individual's uh, intensity, direction and persistence of effort toward attaining a goal. Uh, more or less, the level of motivation definitely varies uh, between individuals and within individuals at different times. And we have also seen that uh, in our previous sessions and lectures that uh, uh, with uh, the given time, with the given context, uh, with the given task, uh, definitely people's uh, attitude uh, towards work, uh, people's behavior towards their workforce and peers definitely vary. So these are definitely important uh, things to look into uh, in motivation. Now according to the book uh, there are three key elements of motivation. Uh, we are talking about intensity that's concerned with how hard a person uh, is trying in uh, his or her work. Uh, then we are talking about direction, uh, which talks about the orientation that benefits the organization. That's how we are looking into this. And then the third uh, talks about persistence, uh, which is a measure of how long a person uh, can maintain her or his uh, effort of that work, of that intensity and towards the direction. In this exhibit 7.1, we are looking into Abraham Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. Uh, here, it's a, it's a very uh, famous theory of motivation. Uh, here, uh, the, the writer uh, behind the theory talks about uh, that uh, within every human being, uh, he thinks that uh, there exists a hierarchy of five needs. Uh, it begins with the psychological, uh, physiological needs uh, that include hunger, thirst, uh, uh, and shelter related uh, other bodily needs. So the second uh, level talks about safety, uh, safety needs. And that includes security uh, and protection from uh, physical and emotional harm. Then um, the researcher uh, talks about uh, the social needs that uh, talks encompasses uh, affection, belongingness, acceptance, friendship, things like that. And then when we talk about uh, uh, this higher level, while when we are reaching it, uh, we the according to the researcher, what we think is, he thinks is that the people find uh, much esteem uh, uh, the internal esteem factors, those actually come into play. And those are, we are talking about uh, self-respect, autonomy, achievement, uh, um, 
things like that. So these are the esteem factors um, at the second level. And then on the top, we are talking about uh, self-actualization. And here, uh, by this, uh, the book meant that it's kind of a drive um, that uh, to become what one is capable of becoming. So we are talking about uh, ambition. We are talking about a lifelong journey. And uh, that includes growth, achieving uh, one's potential, and uh, certainly uh, self-fulfillment. So Maslow separated these five needs into higher and lower orders. Uh, so the, more Im the most important thing, the takeout that I had from this theory is that as a need becomes substantially satisfied, uh, the next need becomes dominant that we see all the time in our uh, life and then no need is ever fully gratified um, a substantially satisfied need in many cases what we have seen that such needs no longer motivates the person as it used to be so that's that's a very interesting uh, um, learning we can have from this theory What we have seen in the book that Maslow's uh, need theory has received uh, wide recognition. It was very popular uh, among practicing managers. But interestingly, uh, the research, the follow-up research uh, does not generally validate the theory. And uh, lately, some researchers have attempted to revive the components of the need hierarchy concept uh, using the principles of evolutionary psycho uh, psychology. Then uh, there is uh, Douglas McGregor's Theory X and Theory Y, uh, which uh, primarily talks about a manager's view of the nature of a human beings, that uh, a manager thinks that it's based uh, on a certain grouping of assumptions and that he or she uh, tends to mold his or her behavior toward employees, uh, towards uh, employees according to such assumptions. So McGregor talks uh, uh, things that Theory X uh, assumes uh, uh, that uh, all, all the assumptions are basically negative. Employees inherently dislike work and whenever possible will attempt to avoid it. And Theory Y, uh, theory y assumes uh, that uh, the assumptions are basically the people's assumptions, the workers' assumptions are basically positive and employees can view work as being as natural as as the rest uh, as taking rest or playing in this slide we see the applications of um, the earlier theories of motivation here uh, in this exhibit 7.2 it's the title is the comparison of satisfiers and dissatisfier so what happens here is um, it, it's initially proposed by the psychologist uh, Frederick Herzberg and uh, he wanted to investigate a question uh, and the question was what do people want from their job uh, and uh, he used the two-factor theory uh, uh, and which is sometimes called, called um, motivation and hy motivation hygiene theory so Herzberg in his research asked people to describe situations in which uh, they felt exceptionally good or bad about their jobs and such responses those responses were then uh, categorized then um, like uh, tab uh, tabulated and categorized and when we analyze these categorized responses uh, what we see that that her Herzberg concluded that intrinsic factors uh, such as, for example, advancement, recognition, responsibility, uh, those seem to be related to job satisfaction. On the other hand, uh, dissatisfied respondents are uh, citing certain extrinsic factors or external factors such as uh, supervision, pay, uh, pay uh, then uh, company policy and working conditions. Um, so what we have seen in the left side 
we are talking about the uh, factors related to extreme satisfaction and on the right uh, figure we are talking about factors related with the extreme uh, dissatisfaction interestingly what happened is uh, and I, I found it uh, very intriguing that uh, the opposite of satisfaction is not always dissatisfaction. Herzberg uh, pr uh, proved that if we remove the dissatisfying characteristics from a job, that does not necessarily always mean that that job will be suddenly satisfying for the people who are involved there. Job satisfaction factors uh, have, have been according to this uh, researcher uh, job satisfaction factors are separated and distinct from the dissatisfaction factors and this exhibit 7.3 explains that uh, in the first uh, figure we are seeing the traditional view right uh, in the left hand side we are seeing satisfaction on the extreme right we are seeing dissatisfaction so the whole idea what we think is uh, s people can be either satisfied, dissatisfied, or in between. But what Herzberg thinks is, first of all, there should be certain motivating factors. So from a no satisfied or um, indifferent uh, state of mind, uh, people can be satisfied, uh, depending on what kind of motivating factors are th present uh, in a workplace. At the other, um, um, and on the other hand, uh, what we also see that uh, there can be some issues where uh, the managers or the leaders are getting rid of some of the factors which will make the workplace less dissatisfied or zero dissatisfied. So there won't be any dissatisfaction but at the same time people are not necessarily motivated or excited about jobs. And Herzberg um, identified that as a hygiene factor. So that's how it, uh, it has the name of motivation and hygiene uh, theory. Now, there have been some criticisms of Herzberg's theory because uh, people are, researchers are talking about that it's limited because it relies on self-reporting and uh, some of the questions have been also raised with the methodology of the question and overall uh, the m main idea was that Herzberg assumed a relationship between satisfaction and productivity how what are the outputs eventual outputs of a company of a workforce but the research methodology that uh, he used looked on uh, only at uh, satisfaction and not at productivity so that was a huge uh, drawback for this theory uh, when we were applying it for the real world. Then comes uh, McClellan's uh, theory of needs. That's another traditional theory which was quite famous and it focuses on particularly three needs. We are talking about uh, 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 needs related to achievement, power and affiliation. So the first one uh, is uh, talking about uh, variables related to achievement needs. Uh, uh, we are talking about uh, the, the variables that drive to excel, to achieve uh, in relation to a set of standards and to strive to succeed. So these are the things uh, that is, uh, so th these are the variables that control such aspirations uh, within a workforce, within a person, within an individual or groups. So high achievers, according to the researcher uh, behind this theory, uh, high achievers perform best when they perceive their probability of success is 50-50. So they like to set goals that require stretching themselves a little. So that's the observation of McLellan's uh, theory of needs uh, for the first one. Then um, he t explains uh, the relation uh, of uh, and the further variables related with need of power and then need of affiliation. Uh, so need of affiliation is 
one of the things that has not been uh, f uh, under focus that much uh, uh, by the uh, OB researchers or the people who are dealing with uh, motivation factors uh, in the industry. But if we look into the need for power, this is also something uh, interesting. Uh, it's uh, by that McClellan's uh, are is talking about the desire to have impact, to have influence, to have influence and control over others, and uh, individuals uh, high in such uh, variable uh, enjoy being in charge. So that's the that's one of the findings uh, of McClellan. Till now, we were talking about different uh, earlier theories of motivation, and in many cases, those were not are not supported by uh, some uh, the research, and uh, in many cases, have fallen out of favor. Uh, on the contrary, the newer theories uh, certainly have uh, the backup of the research, the latest research, and are very popular. So we will start our conversation with uh, self uh, determination theory. Uh, which proposes that people prefer to feel that they have control over their actions. So what happens is anything that makes uh, a, uh, a previously enjoyable task feel more like an obligation to them, to the workforce, uh, then suddenly they feel uh, less motivated. So most of them a, a big part of the research on self-determination theory in uh, organizational behavior uh, has focused on on the cognitive evaluation theory uh, and the main hypothesis behind uh, this cognitive evaluation theory is that extrinsic rewards uh, in many cases will reduce uh, intrinsic interest in a task uh, let's look for uh, let's uh, talk about an example so imagine that uh, when people are paid for work um, in many cases it feels like something they want to do uh, and more uh, it's if uh, it feels less like something they want to do and it feels more like something they have to do so it was more like an obligation so according to the self-determination theory uh, it also proposes that in addition to being driven by a need uh, for autonomy, people at the same time seek, um, seek uh, ways to achieve competence and positive connections to others, to the greater self and to the greater community. Uh, so there is a huge number of studies uh, that support self-determination theory. And uh, it's, uh, there has some major implications related to uh, the work rewards when we are talking about application of self-determination theory. Now, when uh, we were talking about extrinsic, re uh, extrinsic uh, rewards, right? And when organizations use uh, such rewards as payoffs for uh, better performance, uh, what we have seen that mostly employees feel that they're doing a good job. Uh, but at the same time, what the book says is that uh, if uh, we are only using these extrins uh, extrinsic rewards, then in many cases, employees feel that uh, feel less that they're uh, doing a good job. They think that uh, uh, it's not related to their own intr uh, intrinsic desire to excel, and in many cases, it's being imposed. It's uh, it's the need of the organization, not the not something driven by them. So it's 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 a very interesting fine line of how we should motivate the workforce, how we should give uh, the workforce some compensation so that uh, they are not, they don't feel that it's the company who is benefiting, only benefiting from it and it's not them who are, who, who are benefiting from them. So that's definitely a fine line that we need to look into. Uh, so, and then the other thing uh, that uh, this self-determination theory looks into is uh, extrinsic, um, extrinsic rewards uh, increase motivation for some creative task uh, uh, in many ways. Uh, and uh, we might need to place uh, 
in many cases the cognitive evaluation theory's predictions for to understand the broader context of it uh, um, we have uh, the book talks about setting goals uh, because it thinks that goal setting is more effective uh, for improving motivation um, and uh, in many cases that can be uh, pr that in that by that self uh, we can provide rewards for achieving those goals so that that's a good structured way to motivate the workforce uh, so the original uh, authors, uh, when we come back to this uh, uh, main basics of uh, self-determination theory, the original authors uh, acknowledge uh, that the extrinsic rewards um, such as verbal praise uh, and feedback, which is very, very important, feedback about competence. Now, when we talk about self-determination theory what kind of particular rewards we are talking about and again we talked about fine line right now imagine this a sales representative which uh, the example is used in the book uh, so a self re uh, a sales representative uh, is very happy about his or her work and he or she is excited when um, he or she is assigned with more work uh, uh, more assignments related to uh, having more accounts to sell their products. So that is one thing uh, that that keeps her busy and she's more excited about it. But imagine this when we are talking dealing with a programmer uh, who is writing codes and sh he or she loves to write codes. Now you tell her that okay because you are you are so much into coding um, and there is a new standard so you have to code a uh, thousand more lines every time you are programming such and such that can be very very irritating that can be very annoying uh, for that programmer because she can think that oh that's not nice that's not fair um, I, it does not mean that I will be excited uh, just by uh, coding something that has been imposed to me rather than providing me with certain um, excite certain exciting uh, problems in com uh, in computer programming so this is something uh, that's really important for us to look into uh, a recent phenomena uh, like a recent outgrowth of self-determination theory in addition to whatever we are talking about is uh, self-concordance uh, that considers how strongly people's reasons uh, are for pursuing goals uh, and uh, which are consistent with their interest and core values. Uh, so that's, that's something that people are more and more uh, looking into uh, because the writer is saying that if individuals pursue goals because of an intrinsic interest, so there is a high chance that they will be most more likely to attain their goals and be happy about it. Uh, so, so the process of striving toward them should be then enjo more enjoyable, more fun. Uh, but of course, in contrast, if the people who are pursuing certain goals for extrinsic reasons like money or status, uh, there are research that supports that they are less likely to attain their goals and less uh, less likely to be happy even after they attain those uh, goals so that's something uh, interesting to ponder on eventually what does all this mean when we are talking about uh, such applications of uh, self-determination theory what does it mean for individuals uh, at individual level it means that one needs to choose their job uh, choose his or her job for reasons other than extrinsic rewards and for organizations when we're dealing with uh, human resources certainly we need to provide intrinsic as well as ex, uh, extrinsic uh, incentives that's important now it's easier said than done because as we know the in the real life we always sometimes have to choose uh, work uh, based on our certain extrinsic needs and in many cases we do not find excitement in the work we do uh, and it's an ongoing process it's a 
of course we strive to get the best we strive towards achieving the best uh, but what we have seen in real world in many cases that no matter how hard we try it's it's a struggle uh, to have s to attain some job where we are both excited about our uh, payment and at the same time our inner calling and our inner excitement and that previous slide uh, is the leeway towards job engagement uh, here um, the book talks about job engagement as an investment of an employee's uh, physical cognitive and em emotional energy into the job performance and there are many studies um, which are trying to measure job engagement level uh, and different dimensions of job job engagement of employees within a workplace so i would suggest to to definitely look into the book for uh, further clarifications on this we can certainly ask ourselves what makes people more engaged in their job all right and uh, so there are certain stuff uh, first of all the degree to which an employee believes it is meaningful to engage in work that's important this is related to our intrinsic ideas uh, and then of course there has to be a match between individuals values and the organizations that's important and certainly leadership has a crucial role to play uh, leadership behaviors that inspire workers to a greater sense of mission um, that can work as a magic uh, imagine uh, the way people used to be excited with steve jobs when uh, launching uh, the new products and the way they are having this lukewarm reaction to the new ceo uh, that shows uh, the variation of uh, the change of leadership certainly can have uh, impact on uh, workers and customers perception and ideas about uh, products and also levels of motivation that definitely depends on people's behaviors too, leaders behaviors as well when we talk about job engagement and when we talk about measuring different dimensions of job in engagement one thing definitely comes to the comes to our mind and more so in this increasingly globalized flattened world where uh, we are working with engaged with multinational multi-ethnic workforce and leadership managers uh, is uh, uh, to what extent what is the line to what extent the people should be engaged in their work are highly engaged employees getting too much of a good thing and does it really have a dark side does it uh, uh, negatively affect uh, their personal life their social life and what we have seen unfortunately there is a positive relationship between uh, uh, such uh, job engagement higher job engagement and work family conflict so there are many studies on this and many bigger companies many smaller companies uh, worldwide uh, are looking into work-life balance work family balance and uh, there are studies that also shows that um, it's not always uh, necessary for the people to be engaged in work because then eventually people will burn out soon so higher job engagement may not be a good thing so we need to manage it so and this is certainly the responsibility of the managers and the leaders to look into beyond job engagement theory we uh, can also look into the goal setting theory that's uh, related in the book uh, and that talks about the goals that the employees set for themselves that uh, are being assigned uh, and those goals need to be done and it also talks about how much effort in the workplace that is needed to achieve those goals now what the research shows and that's very interesting that the specific goals 
increase performance in workplace. And in many cases, difficult goals when accepted uh, result in higher performance than the easier goals. And of course, what we have seen, observed according to our researchers in the book and in our real life, that the structured feedback uh, definitely leads to higher performance than uh, absence of feedback. That's important. In the book, we see that there are three factors um, that influence the goals. Um, and we are talking about goal commitment. We are talking about task uh, characteristics. And we are also talking about the role of national culture. Uh, so the goal setting theory uh, assumes that the goal commitment is most likely to occur when goals are made public, when the individual has an internal uh, locus of control, he or she thinks he has the idea of what he or she is doing, and the go when and when the goals are set, uh, self-set rather than assigned. So that's an ideal thing when the manager or the leaders are working with the workforce and work together one on one or as a group and together set something that's not imposed. That's not something that can be considered as a burden uh, uh, for our obligation for the workforce or individual. So that's that's important. And then uh, we are also talking about task characteristics and uh, those should be simple rather than complex. Uh, and uh, in many cases, those should be well learned rather than novel. And uh, in many cases, it's important. Of course, it's based on the nature of the job but what we've seen is independent being independent in terms of the task characteristics uh, then in uh, interdependent is important uh, to achieve the goal easily if we are looking into individual performance scales and uh, then culture definitely has a higher role to play uh, uh, what we have seen in the research that goal setting theory is a is is well adapted in the north american cultures uh where individual achievement and performance are most most highly valued uh but at the same time when we are talking about um, high power distance when when you are talking about collective uh, society rather than individual society there we definitely need to uh sometime realign or readjust these uh, applications of goal setting theory maybe there uh, the task characteristic can be interdependent maybe the goal commitment should be more communal uh, community based rather than individual based so those changes can be there what we have seen from our experience and uh, also through the book that uh, people differ in the way they regulate their thoughts uh, they set up their goals and uh, think about tasks uh, so it, it differs from people to people some of the people can be promotion focus um, according to the book uh, that talks about that the strive for advancement and accomplishment and approach conditions uh, that move them closer to their desired goals or aspirations so they are promotion focus the other ones uh, in the book they are talking about prevention focus that they do all the duties and obligations uh, and in many cases avoid the conditions all the conditions that can pull them away from the desired goals so a person can be both at the same time um, uh, promotion focus uh, and uh, a prevention focus so these are some of the things that certainly we see in the workforce when we talk about the um, goal setting theory another theory the book talks about is self-efficacy theory proposed by albert bandura um, here this theory talks about um, an in individual's belief self-efficacy theory it talks about individuals believe that he or she is capable of performing a task and uh, 
this uh, task uh, is uh, that belief is defined by four characteristics and uh, the researcher is talking about inactive mastery uh, which t explains gaining relevant experience with the task assigned task or job then uh, he talks about vicarious modeling uh, which uh, talks about reflects uh, becoming more confident because uh, one sees someone else doing the same task. Then um, within the self-efficacy theory, we, uh, we also see the mention of um, verbal persuasion uh, that occurs when a person is more confident uh, to do something because somebody else convinces her uh, that she has the skills to do it. Uh, and arousal uh, that's the final characteristics of self-efficacy theory which talks about some somebody who can lead uh, and to an energized state uh, driving the person uh, at uh, in focus to complete a certain task this exhibit 7.5 uh, shows the joint effects of goals and self-efficacy uh, on any person's performance here we see that a manager can set up difficult specific goal for a job or task and then individual uh, can have the confidence uh, that given the level of performance he has to be attained he definitely or she can definitely do this at the same time we are also talking about given the confidence that she can do this individual sets up higher personal goal for their performance and then eventually what we see from the confidence uh, through self-efficacy and also the self-setting goals individual can perform higher level of uh, uh, job uh, or whatever things that uh, he or she was assigned to do um, so that we see in this way both are working together uh, of uh, setting personal goals at the same time uh, to be confident uh, in believing one's uh, activities and abilities through uh, the applications of uh, self-efficacy. So what are the implications of uh, self-efficacy theory? First of all, the training programs uh, definitely make, uh, in, many, in most cases, make uh, the human resources more efficient, more, uh, more capable of uh, performing the task here they are assigned to do and um, certainly that has an uh, positive that has a positive effect on the human resources and the performance of the company per se uh, at the same time what we have observed from our book is uh, intelligence and personality are the two factors uh, which are absent from Bandura's list uh, which uh, definitely would we have seen uh, in the book and in other case studies that they can uh, increase self-efficacy. So these are some of the comments uh, we can uh, pass along uh, when we are talking about uh, of some of the upper challenges or opportunities for self-efficacy theory applications. Now let's talk about reinforcement theory. So if we remember while the goal setting uh, theory talks about uh, that it's a cognitive approach and the cognitive approach uh, uh, proposes that an individual's purposes direct uh, his or her action, uh, the inner purposes. Uh, on the other hand, reinforcement theory, the thing that we're talking about in this slide, uh, takes a behavioristic view uh, and it argues that uh, the reinforcement conditions uh, uh, many reinforcements actually conditions behavior uh, so suddenly we can say that these two theories uh, are clearly at odds uh, they're talking about some different things so what in the book talks about further that the reinforcement theorists uh, see that the behavior as environmentally caused and they ignore the inner state of the individual and constant trait solely on what happens when uh, that individual takes some actions so 
we, we can say that because it does not concern itself with uh, uh, what initiates behavior. It is not, strictly speaking, a theory of motivation. But certainly what we have seen is it does provide a powerful means of analyzing what controls behavior. And this is why we typically consider it in discussions for motivation uh, in, the, in, in our classroom setting and, of course, in, uh, uh, in the work setting. So, furthermore, if we explain this, the operant conditioning theory, uh, part of uh, this uh, behaviorism, um, argues that people learn to behave to get something they want or to avoid something they don't want. So, unlike reflexive or unlearned behavior, operant behavior, according to the book, is influenced by the reinforcement or lack of reinforcement uh, brought about uh, by its uh, different consequences. Uh, so such reinforcement uh, strengthens a, a certain behavior and um, increases the likelihood that it will be um, to some extent repeated. So certainly uh, this is very different than the other goal setting um, uh, theory or the other cognitive related stuff that we have seen uh, uh, before um, in our um, discussion. So in its pure form, reinforcement theory ignores feelings, attitudes or different expectations and any other cognitive variables. Um, some researchers uh, look at some ex the same experiments uh, reinforce, uh, reinforcement theorists used to support their position and they are interpreting the findings uh, within a cognitive framework and uh, they're saying that that's, that's definitely uh, possible. Uh, so at the same time, reinforcement is undoubtedly an important uh, uh, factor for behavior, uh, to influence behavior. Uh, but there are few scholars, very few scholars, are prepared to argue that it's the only one. Uh, so the behaviors one engage in uh, at work and the amount of effort one allocates to each task are affected naturally by the consequences that follow. So if one is consistently reprimanded uh, for outproducing uh, uh, the, the colleagues, uh, so certainly that person will uh, reduce uh, their pr his or her productivity, right? Uh, so one might, but one might also explain uh, that kind of uh, l lower level of productivity uh, can be due to my lack of goals, my feeling of inequity, and uh, my uh, problem with uh, expectations. So those factors definitely uh, play good roles to, uh, important roles to uh, ponder on, to think about, to look into. So we talked about different theories um, that explains how people are motivated, how people are thinking, how the workforce is applying those, uh, their different thought processes when they're working uh, and uh, in a positive way or a negative way um, in any organization. Uh, saying those, uh, a very important part of organizational behavior, especially when we talk about motivation, is people's perception about equity, people's perception about justice, uh, specifically the way people are, the managers or the leaders are behaving with them, uh, how uh, they are treated, uh, in the workplace by their peers, by their superiors, uh, and how they're involved in the decision-making process and uh, how involved they think they are in the long-term, short-term strategies and uh, uh, the different work uh, assignments of the company or the organization. And also, uh, are they equitably uh, being uh, compensated for their performance, for their work, and uh, whether or not those uh, the compensation that they're having or those incentives they're, they're being provided 
or the feedback they are given are, are those uh, happening in a transparent way are justice being done um, and uh, uh, is uh, self-respect of every individual being preserved so these are overall the primary criteria um, we definitely look into that falls under equity and justice uh, within the motivation uh, motive uh, within the uh, for motivating any workforce so here we see equity theory uh, is explained in uh, e exhibit 7.6 here uh, a person can uh, believe that inequity is done uh, because of under reward then uh, if they're equal they can say that it's uh, equity but at the same time uh, when uh, somebody is over rewarded uh, that can also be an inequity if that's not something that the person who has been over rewarded deserves so here uh, we are talking about relationship between two different employees um, and uh, uh, their perception about equity and justice so based on people's perceptions based on employees perception about inequity based on uh, their uh, ideas about justice uh, the book talks about that there can be six choices a person has um, in the workplace first of all they can change uh, his or her inputs um, uh, they can change the outcomes so when they're talking about the involvement in the work um, they can distort perceptions about their selves because they can think that uh, they're not worth of the compensation or the feedback or the reward they deserve. Um, they certainly can think uh, differently about others. And uh, uh, also that can uh, force them or help them uh, in a positive or negative way or indifferent way um, to look for some other performance benchmark if uh, there is a discrepancy, there is a mismatch between their mental model of justice and the way it has been delivered. And in many cases, if the person thinks that an uh, inequity happened, uh, she or he can just leave the field, leave the job. That can definitely also happen here. So, in this exhibit 7.7 .7, that the thing that we were talking about that has been uh, explained further we are talking about several justices we are talking about distributive justices where uh, people uh, are uh, so within the organizational justice when you look into as an overarching macro level uh, factor uh, within that there are several uh, different uh, domains of justice as one is distributive uh, justice it talks about whether i'm getting the pay that i deserve or the pay raise that i deserve and then it comes the procedural justice which talks about the system the feedback system the compensation system the um, appraisal system whatever things they have is it fair are they are uh, are they using the managers are using um, a, a single uh, system to talk about everybody uh, to compensate everybody to give feedback to everybody we also talked about it in our previous uh, chapters when we use the examples of uh, Gujarat in India where this guy has uh, uh, provided gifts uh, for the top employees one thing he made sure uh, uh, and this is reference to this uh, Indian uh, multi-billion dollar businessman who gave cars 500 cars and 500 flats and so many other jewelries to his top performers 1200 performers uh, so he made sure that whenever uh, he was uh, selecting the top perf performers uh, that was done in a very transparent way in a very uh, fair way so that's part of procedural justice and then come interactional justice within that uh, we have informational justice where we are talking about um, uh, the people's uh, expectations from their managers that they are providing, uh, uh, they are talking uh, transparently about key decisions uh, and uh, different organizational matter. And then uh, we are also talking about interpersonal justice where it talks about people's expectations and this such uh, talking about uh, expectations uh, about uh, 
uh, equity and justice also is a leeway to talk about expectancy theory which um, argues that a tendency to act in a certain way uh, of a person depends on his or her expectations that the act will be followed by a given outcome and that outcome is attractive for the individual so not only uh, for my work I, I want a feedback and I want uh, a certain positive feedback and that positive feedback from uh, the managers or the uh, organizations I work for certainly should be attractive to me and that should motivate me to work further to uh, focus further on my uh, on the task at hand so that should get me going so th that's explained in expectancy uh, theory um, exhibit 7.8 uh, explains expectancy theory where there are three critical things effort performance relationship uh, and then uh, uh, based on uh, whatever I'm doing uh, certainly has to do with uh, uh, whether or not my performance will be recognized I uh, that how I'm going to give the effort then uh, performance reward relationship is uh, talks about that performance uh, uh, can cash in some reward some good feedback and some some other uh, monetary or any other value um, uh, any other positive things that I value and uh, eventually that talks about the rewards uh, the, and the personal goals uh, relationship that the things that I'm seeing or receiving are something that I really cherish something that I really hoped for and something that can help me to attain my personal goal in the career in my personal life in my social life so that's overall in a nutshell expectancy theory expectancy theory helps explain why a lot of workers are motivated on their jobs and do only the minimum necessary things to get by so Managers can ask three questions uh, uh, the employees need to answer uh, in affirmative so that we can see whether or not they're correctly motivated and those motivation ca can be maximized. So first question is if uh, a person give his or her maximum effort, will it be recognized uh, in the performance appraisal? So and worker definitely a uh, work for uh, employee can definitely ask this uh, and the manager needs to be needs to make sure that uh, she answers this question she make it she make it transparent and then the other one is uh, if I get a good performance appraisal will it lead to organizational rewards and then if I'm rewarded if uh, are the rewards attractive to me so these are the connections uh, at a personal level. The manager has a responsibility to connect with the employees and talk about those and uh, address these concerns, address these questions and tell them that um, what is the position of the employee uh, employers um, uh, due, uh, regarding these questions. So the question becomes, um, does this expectancy theory work? Uh, what we have seen right now, uh, it's like it tends to be more valid in situations where effort performance and performance reward linkages are clearly perceived by individuals. It's, uh, it's uh, more tangible. Uh, and uh, it's also, it, it's workable. Expectancy theory is workable when uh, individuals are actually rewarded for their performance rather uh, than um, uh, instead of seniority or effort or skill level or job difficulty uh, so we are more more open to reward and uh, recognize the sheer performance so if that kind of workforce uh, work uh, environment is available certainly expectancy theory work Exhibit 7.9 uh, integrates much of what we talked about motivation in, uh, in this uh, lecture, in this session. 
So here we can see that the basic foundation is the expectancy model. Uh, expectancy theory predicts that any employee uh, can exert a high level of effort if uh, she perceives that there is a strong relationship between effort and performance uh, and performance and rewards and rewards and the satisfaction of personal goals. So each of these relationships in turn uh, is influenced by different factors uh, for effort to lead to good performance. Uh, an individual certainly should have the requisite uh, ability to perform and the performance appraisal system must be perceived uh, uh, as fair, as transparent and objective. Uh, and the final link uh, uh, in expectancy theory is the rewards goals relationship. Uh, this model also, if we see that it also considers the achievement need reinforcement, uh, equity, uh, uh, justice theories. So high achievers, high rollers, uh, good performers, uh, top per uh, performers are internally driven as long as the jobs they provide they're uh, doing and the, jo the jobs they are assigned with are providing them with personal responsibility, feedback, enough challenges. Uh, so reinforcement theory recognizes that uh, here uh, um, that the organization's rewards reinforce uh, the individual's performance and uh, s these individuals uh, will compare such rewards they receive um, as an outcome uh, from the inputs they make with the outcome input ratio of relevant others and uh, inequities may influence uh, the uh, effort uh, expanded so that's overall the summary now what are the implications for the managers uh, certainly, we need to make sure that the extrinsic rewards for employees are not viewed as coercive. Uh, it should be, uh, instead, uh, we should provide information about competence and relatedness, how these are related. And then uh, we also need to consider goal setting theory. We need to apply this uh, as clear and difficult goals certainly can lead to higher levels of employee productivity so we may would like to um, include that and then of course um, we have to consider reinforcement theory uh, regarding quality and quantity of work uh, equity certainly needs to be there uh, the justice has to be there it has to be transparent so that the workforce is happy and they can feel that the uh, the managers and the leadership is with them on this on the same page uh, and uh, we also see that the managers certainly needs to look into uh, the expectancy theories the applications of it because it offers a powerful explanation of uh, performance variables different performance variables such as um, employee productivity absenteeism turnover so their attachment their perceived possible future uh, near future attachment and performance uh, with and for the company so that's why uh, the m such kind of different motivation uh, related theories are important to under better understand um, the workforce and we certainly need to uh, apply these theories uh, 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 which are which can which are aligned with our company's work so suddenly uh, with those applications the managers can foresee a better performed company thank you